Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our annual Armenian Genocide Commemoration Program. We are grateful that you have joined us this evening for what has become a significant annual program here at Change. My name is Sarah Brown and I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Holocaust, Human Rights and Genocide Education, also known as Change. For those of you who are new to our center, welcome. We have worked now for the past 42 years to promote the elimination of anti-Semitism, racism, and all forms of prejudice through innovative education about the Holocaust, other instances of genocide like the Armenian genocide, and human rights. It has now been just over a year since we went virtual last month, and I'm very grateful to the community for your support as we have provided more than 48 public-facing virtual programs that have now reached over 50,000 people across six continents. If you are interested in learning more about our available resources to support virtual teaching and learning and advocacy efforts, please reach out to us. We would be happy to connect with you. Tonight, we are joining a global community that will recognize and commemorate the Armenian genocide. This is a community that is growing despite the efforts of those who would have us forget or even deny that the genocide ever occurred. We refuse and we thank you, our local community and our partners both near and far for working with us to ensure that each commemoration is meaningful and impactful. This has been a difficult year. The conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan continues even though early on NGOs like Genocide Watch declared the targeting of civilians in Armenia by Azerbaijan a genocide emergency. 106 years since the start of the Armenian genocide on April 24th, 1915, Armenians are again facing targeted attacks. This is a difficult time for Armenians living in and beyond Armenia and we thank you for being here and we stand with you. Before we begin the program, I would like to note that this event is in memory of Arsen B. Harutunian. May his memory continue to be a blessing and a source of inspiration, both for his family and for our community. I'd also like to thank Change staff, Allie Evans and Susan Yellen for helping to make tonight's program possible. And then a very special thank you to Judith Sarion for joining us and for sharing the powerful and inspiring story of Zaba Yasayan. Now, um, we, before we hand things over to Ms. Sarion, I have a short video that she has shared with us about the life and legacy of Zabal Yasayan. Zabal Yasayan was an Armenian author and a political activist and a voice of courage in the early 20th century. She was also the only woman on a list of over 200 Armenian writers and intellectuals who were targeted for arrest and deportation on April 24th, 1915, now recognized as the official start of the Armenian genocide. This brief video will introduce you to her and her legacy. Now, um, briefly, before we play the video, I do want to acknowledge that you may experience some delay in viewing. This is due to, uh, as I said recently, the wonders and also the limitations of the virtual world and live streaming audiovisual content um, via Zoom and into Facebook Live. As a result, please know that a copy of the video, a, a link to the video will be included in the chat and it is available on YouTube for anyone who wishes to view it. So um, briefly, allow me to introduce this video about Zaba Yasayan. Zabel Yasayan, writer of resistance. Zabel Yasayan was born in 1878 in the Skudari district of Constantinople. We know about her childhood because she wrote about it in her memoir, The Gardens of Silidar. The members of my family would spend the day in the rooms toward the back of the house where the window opened out onto a series of groves. Beyond those groves lay the Turkish neighborhoods. In those neighborhoods were magnificent mosques whose slim white minarets joined black cypress trees on the skyline. From a distance, the glistening blue Bosphorus looked like a ribbon and the silhouette of Stambul shrouded in a pink mist in the morning, a golden mist during the day and a blue mist in the evening looked like a colorful, ever-changing ethereal wonderland. Hearing that I hoped to become a writer, Madame Dussap tried to warn me. 
she said that for women, the world of literature was full of many more thorns than laurels. A woman who wanted to carve out a place for herself in society was still not tolerated. To overcome all of these obstacles, I needed to exceed mediocrity. In her words, a male writer was free to be mediocre. A female writer was not. Yesayan published her first works at the time the Hamidian massacres of 1894 to 1896 reached Constantinople, which forced Sabel to flee the city. She seized the opportunity to go to Paris to study at the Sorbonne. While there, she married the painter Dikran Yesayan and gave birth to a daughter, Sophie. At the maternity hospital, Yesayan observed the harsh conditions for poor women. She wrote her first novel, In the Waiting Room, which described the discrimination and mistreatment of Eva, a North African Jewish emigre. Yesayan returned to Constantinople as an editor of the women's pages of a journal. Along with other Armenians, she supported the overthrow of the Sultan and the reinstatement of the Constitution, granting greater human rights for all, including the minorities. Less than a year after the revolution, a counter-revolution led to widespread massacres of Armenians in Adana. Yesayan joined an Armenian delegation to provide relief for the orphans. Two years later, she published In the Ruins, her eyewitness testimony of the aftermath of the massacres, in which she gave voice to the victims, particularly the women and children. Yesayan's goal was to create an empathetic bridge between the reader and the victims. It is essential, I repeat, that all of us see our bleeding country in its true colors, that we learn to take a hard, courageous look at it. Her heartfelt impressions did not reach her intended audience. Four years later, under the cover of World War I, the young Turk government initiated the genocide of three quarters of the Armenians on their ancestral homelands. On April 24, 1915, approximately 250 Armenian intellectuals were arrested and targeted for deportation and death. Zabel Yesayan was the only woman on the list. Her mother and five-year-old son were at home when the authorities came to find her. Her mother secretly sent word to her, and Yesayan went into hiding. I had forgotten my morning veil, and I passed through the Armenian quarters with my head held high, but all the time feeling that I was gradually fading away. Any chance encounter could deliver me to the enemy. Any corner of the street could place me face to face with informers or the police. Yesayan escaped from Constantinople to Bulgaria and then to Baku where she transcribed the eyewitness testimony of survivors of the genocide. In 1917, she published the testimony of Haik Toroyan in Kords, an Armenian journal in Baku. He described the deportations and massacres that he had seen from Aleppo to Baghdad, all along the Euphrates River. Young women, girls and boys were taken by force or dispersed among the Muslim population. Many of the women were sold as slaves and tattooed. In a letter from Baku, she wrote, Whenever I am alone, which rarely happens, I isolate myself in that corner of my soul, which shelters my novel's universe. In that refuge, there is neither massacre, nor deportations, nor Bolsheviks, nor anything else, but only sunshine, roses, and the eternal song of love, beauty, and grace. In 1919, Yesayan delivered her letter to the head of the Armenian peace delegation in Paris about the enslavement of Armenian women and children in Muslim households with recommendations on how to free them. Yesayan stayed in Paris after the war with her daughter and son. Her husband had passed away, and she continued to write. After visiting Soviet Armenia in the 1920s and writing her impressions in Prometheus Unbound, Yesayan decided to move to Armenia with her daughter Sophie in 1933. Her son joined them a year later. Together they lived at the house of the professors on Apovian Street. Yesayan became a bridge between Western Armenians from the former Ottoman Empire and the Eastern Armenians living in the struggling Soviet Republic. When asked how she could suffer the inconveniences of Yerevan after the comforts of Paris, she replied, these inconveniences are meaningless in my eyes because I take an active part in building the future of our country. Does that answer your question? On June 27, 1937, Zabel Yesayan was arrested by Stalin's henchmen because she had spoken out in defense of her fellow writers. Accused of being a French spy, she was imprisoned for five years and then disappeared without a trace. 
The building where she lived at 32 Apollyon Street is still there today. It's situated on a leafy, leafy street in downtown Yerevan. Most people who currently live on Apollyon Street have not heard of Zabel Yesayan, or if they have heard of her, have not read her books. There's a small stone marker, which is very difficult to find. Bridging east and west, Zabel Yesayan fought for human rights, social justice, and human dignity in the Ottoman Empire and Soviet Armenia. That is a tremendous video. And every time I watch it, I'm further inspired by how much she managed to achieve. Um, and I look forward to learning more about her now, thanks to our wonderful speaker, Judith Sarian. It's now my privilege to introduce Ms. Sarian. After a successful career in the financial services sector, Judith Sarian retired in order to pursue her passion for literature and the history of Armenian women's activism. 10 years ago, after watching a documentary entitled Finding Zabo Yesayan, Sarian was determined to introduce this groundbreaking author's legacy to a wider audience. She joined a group of women from the Armenian International Women's Association, and together they arranged for the English translations of three of Yesayan's works. Sarian is also co-editor of the first English translation of, and I'm going to try to say this properly, um, Shapruhi Dusab Maida's Drusop's Meda, Echoes of Protest, a novel originally published in 1883, advocating equal rights for women. She serves on the boards of the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, Democracy Today, and the Advisory Council of Facing History and Ourselves. Please join me in welcoming Judith Sarian. Now I'm going to hand things over to you and mute myself because I just, I'm very much looking forward to this talk. Thank you very much, Sarah. And I also want to thank Ali from Change and the entire Change team for inviting me here today or to this evening. I'd also like to thank Karen Richardson Bedrosian and Adrian Harutunyan McComber for introducing me to Change. Today, we are here to commemorate the Armenian genocide and to talk about Zabel Yesayan, who played a key role um, in the genocide and also on the history of April 24th. I also want to talk about a question. And that question is, who writes history? Who are the ones who create the narrative and control the reality? Zabel Yesayan was a crucial figure in modern Arme Armenian history before, during, and after the genocide. She was a very gifted writer. She chronicled some of the most important events in Armenian history, the massacres of Adana in 1909 and the genocide itself, which uh, lasted from 1915 to 1923. She also presented a very important paper to Bokos Nubar Pasha, who was the head of the Armenian delegation at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919. This paper addressed the sexual violence against Armenian women and children during the genocide. She stood up to two empires, first the Ottoman Empire and then the Soviet Empire. And yet she was all but forgotten until the early 2000s and the interest in Zabel Yesayan started to grow. And it grew in many different places around the world. It really had, had kept alive in France because she had a very strong connection with France. But it, it uh, appeared in Canada, in Turkey, in Yerevan, and um, in the United States. And in the United States, it started in, 19, in 2011 when we saw a film and a group of us from the um, Armenian International Women's Association uh, decided to um, commission translations of some of her works. In today's talk, I want to emphasize Zabel Yesayan's courage in the face of grave dangers, her empathy for others, 
And this is not only her fellow Armenians. Her ability to bear witness in the most terrible of situations and her struggle for human rights. Zabel Yesayan was born Zabel Hovanisyan in Skudari, which is on the Asian side of Constantinople. It, it was a middle-class community. Um, her family was always um, in precarious financial situation because uh, her father uh, really could not manage his affairs very well. She had a very basic primary education. She went to school uh, for four years, a uh, school uh, which still exists now in, in Constantinople, an Armenian school. She graduated when she was 14. But she writes in her memoir that her father was her greatest influence. She learned about human rights and human dignity from him. And I will just read a very short passage from The Gardens of Silidar, her memoir. And so you can see the book here. Um, I will just read a very short passage where she describes her relationship and her, her feelings about her father. My father treated everyone's dignity with the same respect and consideration and strongly protested if he saw someone try to trample on someone else's pride. He did not discriminate against people, wealth, especially not wealth, class, and nationality were not factors in determining his opinion of a person. He thought people who acted this way were despicable, lacked a sense of decency, and should not even be considered human beings. His moral consciousness, guiding principles, and understanding of morality all grew out of these ideals. Zabel Yesayan published her first works at the age of 17. This was in 1895. And it was right in the middle of the Hamidian massacres, which lasted from 1894 to 1896. And these were really the first intensive massacres against the Armenians. And it's estimated that uh, somewhere between 100,000 to 250,000 Armenians and, and other Christian minorities were killed in these massacres. And these happened across the Ottoman Empire. They reached Constantinople. And uh, there was a lot of uh, concern uh, for the intellectuals in Constantinople. And Zabel Yassayan had actually been going to a salon, a literary salon, even though she was so young, um, because of her great literary interest. And uh, she'd been going there. And there were um, people there who were connected to newspapers that had a political um, uh, uh, influence that had political influence that were connected to political parties. So this was considered dangerous now for her. And so her father looked for ways to, uh, to help her to leave uh, Constantinople, at least for a while. And she jumped at the opportunity because this was her opportunity to go to Europe and to study. She was able to go to Paris and study uh, literature and philosophy at the Sorbonne and this was um, you know, her, her great dream growing up. While she was there, um, she got married and had her first child. So had, it, had the ability to experience uh, the French medical system. And because of this, um, probably uh, she was very much influenced and she wrote her first novel. Her first novel is uh, entitled In the Waiting Room, Spasman Sarahi Mech. And in it, she describes the conditions of this maternity hospital and how they mistreated immigrants and poor women, uh, some of whom were prostitutes. She focuses on the life of a young Jewish emigre from North Africa, Eva, who is married to a, uh, to a young Frenchman. And they, they're, they're quite poor and they barely have enough money to live on. Um, and she has a terrible fever and is unable to uh, feed milk to her, to her newborn. So Ava has to go to the hospital on a regular basis to get milk. And she is really discriminated against by the hospital personnel. So you can see that Yesayan was already very empathetic uh, towards people um, who she 
who felt were, were being discriminated against. And here you can see the influence of her father. Uh, Yesayan also joined a French peace organization that was started by a Polish woman living in France. And then um, in 1902, she came back to Constantinople and she worked as the editor of the women's pages of a journal called Zarik, where she wrote many articles about uh, women's role in society, about teachers, about women who are teachers. Um, and she also uh, published her book, Spasman Serahimech, in Armenian, in serialized form. In this period of time, she was also a teacher. Um, you know, she did a variety of things to, to um, earn her living. Her husband was an artist, so he, he wasn't really able to support the family. So she really had to support her family. And I just heard a wonderful story yesterday from Adrian um, Harutunya Macomber. She told me about her great aunt, Zaruhi, who was born in Constantinople in 1889 and who actually had Zabel Yesayan as a teacher in, in Constantinople in the early 1900s. So this was very exciting news for me. I, I, uh, I really got goosebumps when I heard about it. Um, and she told me a story. Um, her, her great aunt went to Zabel Yesayan's home because she needed to see her. And when um, Digin Yesayan answered the door, she was wearing an apron and had a long wooden spoon in her hand. And uh, Digin Yesayan noticed that there was a perplexed look on Zarui's face. And she said to her, to the young student, she said, uh, you know, this instrument is as important as a pen. Now I thought that was, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a touching and amusing story. And it actually tells us a lot about the roles of women um, that haven't changed so much that uh, women um, in addition to, you know, working um, outside the home or their careers, they also uh, have to spend a lot of time taking care of their family. And, and uh, so I thought that was quite, quite, a, quite a wonderful story. So at this point, Zabel Yassayan uh, wanted to start an Ottoman women's peace organization. Um, and she had met with several uh, Muslims while she was in Paris and she reached out to them and they showed a great deal of interest in, um, in uh, joining her efforts. So she wanted to make it multicultural and multi-religious. Um, this was a time when there was a lot of hope in, in um, the empire. The young Turks overthrew the Sultan and there was uh, now a time when there were greater human rights, um, particularly for the minorities. Um, so there was a, this was a time of hope, but the hopes were dashed um, not long afterwards. Uh, because in 1909, in, in, in April of 1909, um, news came to Constantinople of massacres in Adana. Zabel Yesayan was asked by the Patriarchate of Constantinople, this is the head Armenian religious leader, to go to Adana and to provide relief for the orphans and to observe conditions. Um, so that she went with the, the second delegation to Adana and um, uh, she was, uh, you know, immediately thrust into in a very uh, terrible, um, overwhelming situation. Um, she was overwhelmed by the scenes of horror and the stories that she heard. She listened to the survivors and wrote down their accounts. She provided clothing and other humanitarian aid for uh, the women and children who were survivors. She worked on behalf of the orphans. She even came face to face with Jamal Pasha, one of the architects of the genocide that will be coming um, six years later. Um, and she, uh, she got into an argument, argument with him about what language the orphans would be taught in because she wanted to make sure that they were still taught in Armenian so that their culture and their heritage would not be erased. She also met with prisoners, both Armenian and Turkish, and carried their requests, listened to their requests and carried it to the authorities. So she really was, you know, working um, in, in a very open-minded way, even though she met with lots of anger and resistance from the local Turkish community. She chronicled her experiences and the accounts that she heard in a book in the ruins 
which was published only two years after her return to Constantinople in 1911. The book is very powerful. It is one of the books that we have translated. We published it in 2016. In the book, she gives accounts of the survivors and uh, she bears witness to their experiences. And, and this is the book, um, I guess it's In the Ruins, um, Averagne Rumech. And I will read two short passages. The first one describes her experience when she sees the orphans. And the second is from the preface where she describes her um, concept of what it means to be a citizen. Sometimes a child under the influence of a bad dream lifted its head and looked around in terror. In the first few days we were told the ravings of one child had repeatedly alarmed all the others sleeping in the same room and still half asleep, not knowing where they were all of them had leapt to their feet screaming in the belief that they were reliving the hours of the massacre. Although I had resolved to maintain my sang froid, I was deeply disturbed by the anonymous mass of children deprived of affection and a mother's love and care. I made up my mind to leave so that our presence would not perturb their slumber. Some were sighing and all had woken up and were casting uneasy glances our way. We were getting ready to go when I noticed the little slip of a girl practically at my feet. Two bright, unblinking eyes were looking at me. Her blonde hair was strewn over her pillow and her emaciated neck and equally emaciated arms and legs spoke of such severe spiritual and physical deprivation that I lost control of myself and started to weep. Although I managed to stifle my sobs, the children heard me and woke up. For an instant, a strange stillness prevailed. They were all holding their breaths. Then heads were raised and a child started to cry. On that signal, hundreds of children seized by terrible convulsions suddenly began sobbing, screaming and weeping in unison, their frail, strengthless limbs twisting and turning on their ragged blankets as they called out to the parents they had lost. It took us a long time to calm them down. When they had at last laid their tired heads down to rest on their pillows, the little girl's two bright eyes were still looking at me. Before leaving, when I approached her to find out why she hadn't gone back to sleep, she stretched her arms out toward my neck and held me close for a long while. I looked in on all the children again before leaving. The room was quiet and calm. People assured me that now they would sleep soundly till morning. Yet it seemed to me that those children would dream without pause, with merciless insistence of the days of horror they had endured and that nightmares would hover constantly over their dusky heads. That was from the chapter, The Orphans. Um, now I'll just read a very short passage from the preface. Thus, I shall be endeavoring to communicate to all the members of our nation, but as well to all those compatriots who have remained indifferent to our instinctive reactions and our pain, a sense of the unrelieved misery of our somber existence that I shared for three months. For then no one will dare approach with contempt or hatred the humble people who armed with unbending faith shall blindly instinctively, despite revolting injustices and the gallows erected on the still smoldering ruins, put their bleeding, ravaged existence at the disposal of progressive movements and stand up before the greatest danger now threatening the fatherland, the return of tyranny in whatever novel forms and masks it might appear. It is essential, I repeat, that all of us see our bleeding country in its true colors, that we learn to take a hard, courageous look at it. What I saw and heard was such as to rock the foundations of the whole state. In principle, no one affirms the contrary. That sentiment was for me 
as a free citizen and true child of this land, enjoying the same rights and charged with the same duties as everyone else, a powerful motivation to write these pages without reserve. They should be considered less the fruit of an Armenian woman's susceptibilities than the spontaneous heartfelt impressions of an ordinary human being. From 1912 to 1913, there was the war in the Balkans and uh, the Ottoman Empire was, they were losing the war. And uh, Yesayan, along with many others in Constantinople, could see and hear the soldiers returning um, through Constantinople, trudging through Constantinople. They were, they were returning in, 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 they were in terrible condition, um, hungry and, and uh, poorly dressed and, uh, and, and, and sick. And while she heard and saw that, she wrote a, a treatise called Enough, Pavagane, which was basically her cry for peace. And she argued here that the rich just sit idly by while the poor have to send their children, their sons to fight in war. And she, you know, she uh, wrote uh, how terrible this was. And uh, this, this was not published until much later, not until the, the 1920s. In 1915, on April 24th, Zabel Yesayan was on the list of over 250 intellectuals, including doctors and lawyers, writers, musicians, um, priests, who were on the, the list targeted for arrest and deportation and death. When they came to Zabel Yesayan's house, her mother was there and, and Zabel was not. She, uh, she was out visiting a friend. Her mother got word to her and she immediately went into hiding. She hid uh, for a couple of months. Um, at one account, uh, she had, uh, they said that she had hid in a hospital where one of her relatives worked. Um, we know that she initially went from house to house trying to find a place to hide. She eventually decided that she had to leave, that it wasn't safe and she, uh, dressed up as a, a Greek seamstress and was able to cross the border to Bulgaria. And as soon as she got to Bulgaria, she did whatever she could to help her colleagues, her peers who were what she thought were in prison um, or worse. And uh, she, she uh, spoke with the media, with the French media. She spoke with um, uh, government uh, officials, with diplomats to try to, to help the condition of, of the Armenians. Um, what she knew to be their condition in Constantinople. At this point, she had no idea what was happening in, in, the, um, uh, you know, in, the, in the provinces. And she was able to get the release of one woman, one young woman who had been imprisoned before April 24th. It was in 1914. Um, this woman's name was Vartui Kalantar. Uh, she had gone to Vienna to study and uh, she had written home to her her parents and her letters included accounts of Armenian political organizations in Vienna. And because of that, when she returned to Constantinople, she was, she was imprisoned um, with her father. And uh, in Vartui Kalantar's obituary that she wrote um, of herself, she said specifically that Zabel Yesayan helped to, um, to gain her uh, release from prison in Constantinople. So here was Zabel working tirelessly on behalf of others. Um, a personal story about Vartui Kalantar. Um, she came to the United States after her imprisonment, after she was released. She actually wrote about this uh, experience um, and, and uh, that will be published soon um, in English, uh, I believe by Lerda Ekmekjoglu and Melissa Bilal, the account of her experience in the women's prison. This is Vartui. But we knew Vartui Kalantar. She was a very close friend of our families and we used to call her Aunt Vart. So it's just amazing, these, these amazing connections that, that you, know, you don't even think about as a child. And I, and I, of course, knew nothing about her imprisonment when I was growing up. Yesayan then went from Bulgaria to Tiflis, Georgia, and then to Baku, where she spent a couple of years. And again, she was feverishly taking down the accounts of the genocide. And this is where she met Haik Toroyan. Haik Toroyan, 
was um, an Armenian um, who was uh, an assistant to a German officer who was fighting, you know, in the war, and the and the Germans and the Turks were, you know, allies, and uh, he had witnessed uh, terrible uh, scenes of of massacre and 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 uh, the death marches of people of the Armenians through Mesopotamia. In fact, the scenes were so horrible that the German officer committed suicide. Haig Teroyan somehow got to uh, Baku and he, he met Zabel Yassayan and Zabel Yassayan decided that she had to write down his account. In fact, he wanted her to. And uh, she uh, wrote it down verbatim, but she was the one to publish it because she had a well-known name and she felt that if she published it and he felt the same, that it would gain a lot more attention, particularly in the international press. She did write a preface to this and, and explained what she was doing. And she said, this is not literature. I can no longer write literature about what is happening. I can only bear witness. But during this time, she did think about novels and literature because she needed a place to go in her head that was not connected to, to massacre and to, um, and to death and, and starvation. So she, um, she thought about the book that she was uh, going to write uh, called Hokis Aksorial, um, My Soul in Exile, which became one of her more famous novels. And um, I can just read a very short paragraph just so you get a taste of, of what it's like uh, because the, the language is so beautiful. A newly blossomed flower perfumes the air a shooting star traces its luminous furrow across the sky and frogs croak in the pools of the vegetable gardens, a protracted, stubborn, monotonous sound. How penetrating, moving and deep that eternal song of the frogs is. It reminds me of other springs and with surprising force arouses a homesickness in me. All I want is to lie down, rest and think about everything I have to do tomorrow but I am glued to the spot by those humble animals love sick spring song. It is as if I were still far from Constantinople in my father's house in Skudari. It is as if I were only remembering that croaking, as if a tender emotion were disarming my soul. In 1919, uh, Zabel Yassayan wrote a letter to Bohos Nubar Pasha, who was the Armenian um, head of the delegation the, the, to the Paris Peace Conference. Um, this letter was entitled The, uh, the um, Enslavement of Armenian Women and Children in Muslim Households in Turkey. And it described the sexual violence experienced by these women and children. Um, and this was quite unusual because she was very direct about it. And uh, this was often not, I mean, this was very rarely done. And I think it may be one of the first official accounts of sexual violence against women in genocide. She also spoke about this at uh, the Sorbonne in the office, uh, in the hall of the engineers. She continued to live in Paris uh, after the war and um, interestingly, in 1928, she published a book, a novel called Meliha Nuri Hanam. And this was uh, a novel with, with uh, most of the protagonists were Turkish. And so again, we see that Yesayan was not only writing about the people she you know, was closest to, her, her family, the Armenians, but she, she had written about the French, she had written about immigrants, she wrote about Turkish people. Eventually, she decided that she could no longer stay in France, that she, she felt a, a call, a pull to Armenia itself, Soviet Armenia. Um, and uh, she went to Soviet Armenia in 1933. Um, she was part of the Writers' Union. She spoke at the first Writers' Conference in Moscow. And at that conference, she supported uh, Yeri Shecharens, a great Armenian poet. And uh, she spoke out for him, um, but he was also, um, uh, 
very much on the radar of Stalin's henchmen. Um, both of them were arrested in June of 1937. Zabel Yassayan was sentenced to death. She fought her sentence. She actually petitioned the highest military court in Moscow. And it was amazing that she was actually able to get her sentence commuted from a death sentence to 10 years hard labor. This again was just a very highly, highly unusual um, situation. She spent uh, time in prison in Yerevan, the capital of Armenia, and in Gyumri. And then she went to prison in Baku, where she had lived in 1916 and 1917, taking down eyewitness account. Now she was there as a prisoner. She was supposed to be sent to a labor camp, but sometime in the 1940s, um, probably 1942 or 43, um, they, they were sending her from Baku to the labor camp and she disappeared on the way. And we really have no idea what happened to her. We have no idea where her remains are. She was lost without a trace. And in effect, her story was lost too because during Stalin's reign of terror, no one was supposed to talk about the people who had been sent off to, to labor camps who had been imprisoned. Even her family had to be very careful. She had a son and daughter. But in the 50s, finally, after Stalin died, her son and daughter petitioned for her to be exonerated. Um, so she was officially rehabilitated in 1957. And, uh, found not guilty of the crimes that they accused her of. Her daughter had saved her books and her letters and personal items. And we're lucky that they're in the Museum of Literature Art in Yerevan. And the archives have, are very rich and um, still there's so much to learn from them. So um, there's plenty of work to do for anyone who would love to research her life. There's still so much we, we need to know about Zabel Yassayan. Um, in the 60s, what her novel, uh, one of her novels was published posthumously. Also a book of her letters was published. Um, but then after independence, Armenian independence in September, 1991, um, this is a time when we would have expected more attention to be paid to Zabel Yesayan. In fact, less attention was paid to her. And she was left out of the curriculum, the secondary school curriculum. Um, and uh, only, only uh, Armenian male writers were included. She fell again into a level of obscurity for a while, but not for too long, because as I said, in the early 2000s, again, interest started to grow around the world. And it, as I said, it included Paris. And in Canada, Victoria Rowe, a scholar, published a book on Armenian women writers and in 2003, where she included uh, a very uh, beautiful piece, a very brilliant piece by about Zabel Yassayan. In 2009, two documentary um, filmmakers, one from uh, Turkey and one from originally Beirut and then Canada and then Yerevan, um, created a film about Zabel Yassayan called Finding Zabel Yassayan. And then in 2011, um, that film came to uh, Massachusetts and a group of us saw it at the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research. And uh, we decided that this was, uh, that, that we had to shine a light on this amazing woman. And we decided to commission um, translations of her work. So um, this included uh, Barbara Mergarian and Joy Rangelian Berge and Danila Terpanjan. Um, and so the, we worked together and first we published two books and in 2014 and then a third in 2016. And then we recently published Maida, which is by Serpui Dusa. And I wanted to, to tell you that this, this work continues, um, this, this effort to bring Zabel Yassayan's work and life and her, her activism to, to 
the current generation continues. And today I'm working with a, a wonderful group of women from all over the world to um, put up posters in the capital in Yerevan um, that, uh, that commemorate Zabel Yassayan uh, as a writer, as a feminist, as a political activist. Um, and these posters have been uh, designed and we hope that they will be up um, in the city. Um, it's, it's something called Armenian Giants. Um, Hi Medzer. And uh, there are about 100 posters already in Yerevan. They've been there for several years. Um, about 98 of them are of men. So it will be a great uh, contribution to have Zabel Yassayan, as well as Shushani Gurginyan, who is a writer uh, born in Eastern Armenia. Um, it will be great to have them with their, with their faces and their, and their short bios um, in Yerevan so that young women and young men and, and everyone can, can see the contributions they've made. All this represents change. All, uh, the women and some men who've worked either independently or together have changed how history is written by rediscovering the works of Zabel Yassayan and bringing them uh, to all of us, bringing them to the public. There is a saying from Zimbabwe, until the lions start writing their stories, the hunters will always be the heroes. There's no doubt that Zabel was a lion. She told her own story. But because she was a woman and a member of an oppressed people, her story was lost almost. She is only one person, one writer, out of a tremendous group of exceptionally talented Western Armenian writers who were being published um, in, in Constantinople and elsewhere in the late 19th and early 20th century. This was the time of the Renaissance. The Armenians call it Zartonk, Renaissance. And these writers include Daniel Varujan and Siamanto, Serpui Dusa and Ruben Sevag, Krikor Zorab and Mitzag Medzarens, all incredible writers. Most of these writers have only had a small part of their works translated into English. They've written in Western Armenian and Western Armenian is read by a smaller group of people each year. I think the UN has designated it a dying language. So that even though all of these people wrote their stories and intended to be heard, many of them were killed during the genocide at the peak of their literary output. And they weren't heard because they were the chroniclers of an oppressed people. Instead, the people who were the victors, not because they won the war, quite the contrary, but because they were powerful and now more numerous because they had destroyed the indigenous population. They had destroyed the Armenians, the Assyrians, the Greeks. These were the indigenous population of Asia Minor, of the Armenian highlands. Now the people who were the powerful were writing the history, creating the reality. But they literally rewrote the history. Armenians are not included in textbooks unless they're described as traitors. They're not included in tour guides. The architects, musicians, statesmen, doctors, lawyers, actors, all of these people who were a part of the rich life of Constantinople, who helped to make the city what it is, what it was and what it is today, they are mostly ignored and forgotten. Their works are ascribed to other people. When I was 13, a friend of mine asked me, why do you talk about this? This is really a terrible story. It happened so long ago. 
Well, actually, that was more than 50 years ago. She asked me that question. Um, so, yeah, now another 50 years have gone by. At, at that point, about 50 years had gone by since the genocide. Now another 56 years have gone by. And I don't really remember what I told her. I know it really upset me. But my answer today is that I'm proud of the Armenians for fighting, fighting for justice, for their voices to be heard. This is not only about the past. And it's not only about the Armenians. This is about the future and the lessons we can learn. It's about the future to prevent, it's about the prevention of future genocides. And it's for all people and especially minorities who are oppressed by tyrannical and murderous governments. If Biden recognizes the Armenian genocide, which I expect he will, it will represent a sea change in the US government's policy. We will finally stop appeasing the Republic of Turkey, which is a country whose founder, Kemal Ataturk, admired, was admired by Adolf Hitler. A country that has consistently since the 1890s used violence against its minorities, the Armenians, the Greeks, the Assyrians, the Kurds, the Yazidis, the Jews. The only group among these that still live in Turkey in any number are the Kurds, and they are constantly under assault. The rest are gone, except for some small groups of Armenians and, and a very small, tiny group of Greeks and Jews. They were either murdered or expelled or forced to leave because there was so much discrimination. The people who control the narrative and continuously repeat it and suppress other voices are the ones who create the reality. Let's change history by changing who tells the narrative. Will it be the victors who rewrote history to justify their crimes, their displacement of people, their murder? Or will it, will it be Zabel Yesayan and the many Western Armenian writers and the Armenian descendants today who refuse to back down, who honor their ancestors who were slaughtered and who stand up for the truth and who will change the future by taking action in the present. Thank you. Thank you, that was, um, that was powerful and what a thorough and beautiful honoring of her memory to tell her story. Now, I was thinking about what you were saying about um, this idea that um, we have to change who's telling the narrative and shining a bright light on upstanders, advocates, um, activists like Zabo Yasayan. I think that is changing the narrative. It's adding to the narrative. It's making sure that we, we don't forget. So thank you, that was incredibly powerful. Um, I don't even know where to start with these questions. Um, I think that the first place I wanna to go to is you were talking about the fact that Zabal Yasayan, uh, I mean, by 17, she's published, she's in literary salons, she's advocating, she's when pregnant, also advocating in maternity wards and documenting. I mean, where do you think, or does she ever in her writings reflect on where she got this not just the teachings, clearly she got wonderful teachings from her father, as you were talking about, who is this proponent of 
of human rights for everyone. But where did you get this energy and this fire to go and really do something about it over and over and over again? Wow. Yeah, that's a wonderful question because she she didn't stop. You know, she was relentless. And you know, there was I mean I think that from a young age she was just um determined to um She, she, she was very, <clears throat> I, okay, I will step back. She, she lived in an unusual family and, you know, she was the oldest in the family. And I think that, uh, you know, and she had three aunts who doted on her. Um, her mother was quite ill. She had mental illness. Um, so I think that from an early age, she saw a lot of suffering. Um, her mother's illness was, was uh, very, um, you know, just cast a pall on the family. Um, and she had a brother who died at a, you know, at a young, very young age, you know, less than a year old. Um, and I think her mother's illness was, was caused by that. She probably had postpartum depression. Mm. So Isabel was alive at that time. She was like a young girl. She saw that and she felt that illness was a monster. In fact, in her book, um, The Gardens of Silidar, she talks about the monsters and, and illness was one of them and poverty was one of them. And, um, and then the mistreatment of people. And, 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 and uh, that was the third. And so she was determined to fight against them. And I, um, I'd love to read another little piece. I don't know if I could find it quickly. If I can't, I won't read it, but she did say that like, she was just determined to always fight. Um, and if she lost, um, she said, I would just, you know, like brush off my, you know, shoulders or my knees or whatever. And I would just go back and fight again. Here it is. She said, my personality was met with fierce resistance. I was continuously forced to fight both physically and mentally, but I never thought the fight was beyond my capabilities and I had no intention of retreating. I was in a constant struggle against my family, my school, and my peers. I would sometimes experience a temporary victory, but I would more often experience defeat. These losses would not embitter me or cause me to lose hope. I would absorb the defeat, neutralize it, immediately accept that I had lost and start a new battle. That approach became a necessity in my life even as an adult, I found myself behaving in much the same way in many other circumstances and situations. I might need to get that quote and put it on the wall immediately behind my computer for those moments when you're feeling like the, the victories are small. That is such a, that's one. So she, she just had this tremendous drive, this sense of in fighting injustice and energy. Um, we have some other questions that are coming in and for anyone who's following along on the live stream, um, alongside the live stream video is a comment section. Please feel free to add your comments and questions there. Um, the one question is, um, how did Yasayan's, uh, Zabel Yasayan's children escape the Armenian genocide? And you mentioned that her husband passed away. What happened to him? So yes, yeah, so this again is a fascinating part of her life that I didn't talk about. So she um, she came back to uh, Constantinople in 1902 and um, went back and forth to Paris for a while, but decided she wanted to stay in Constantinople. But her husband refused. He was born there, but he wanted to go back to Paris. He was a painter and he felt that he should be able to paint in plein air, outdoors, and they wouldn't let him in Constantinople. Um, so she, her daughter, who was born around 1900, stayed in Paris with her father um, because they felt she would get a better education there. And I think at some point her two sisters also had moved to Paris. So there was family there. Um, but Sabel lived apart from her daughter for many, many years. She would see her maybe a couple times a year when she went back and forth to Paris. But from 1905 to 1915, um, she, her daughter did not live with them, with her in Constantinople. Her son was born in 1910. So he was much younger. 
And so he wasn't going to school and uh, he was living with Zabel and her mother in, in uh, you know, in their home in Constantinople. So um, how did he escape? So what happened is amazingly, um, they were able to follow her to Bulgaria a few days after she um, had crossed the border. It's, it's just amazing because one would, I would have just thought that they would have come after them, but they didn't know that she had escaped, you know, um, the, the Turkish, uh, you know, rulers or leaders, they didn't know that she had, she had, you know, taken on an alias and, and, and gone to Bulgaria. Wow. Um, and in the end, her husband, so her husband did not pass away as a result of the genocide. He passed away later of natural causes or, or otherwise. He died of tuberculosis in Paris um, in 1921. It was 21 or 22. And so you can see how poor they were. I mean, they, they were poor too. I mean, you know, this was, this was a very, it, it was, she was always struggling financially. But I think again, her, the example of her father who was, you know, constantly struggling financially was just her, you know, her, her source of strength. She figured, well, he, he, he just would manage and, and she would too. Mm -hmm. Um, I have another question, which is um, the amazing determination in this drive, this upstanderism that she clearly embodies throughout her life. And from a very young age, was it shared by her children? Did they carry on that legacy? Um, I do believe her daughter, you know, had a very strong determination. Um, she was a, a librarian, and I think that she chose to do that because she wanted to make sure her mother's legacy wouldn't be forgotten, and she took very good care of it in Soviet Armenia. Um, I'm not, you know, I think her son was a scientist, so I don't think uh, they were necessarily activists, um, but her grandson and great-grandchildren do live in Yerevan today, and, and I've had the honor to get to know them. And uh, you know they they feel very strongly about her. They you know and they're they're they you know I mean feel like she's a true inspiration to them. Um, another question here: Could you tell us? It's wonderful news about the posters initiative. Could you tell us a little bit more about it? Uh, well, this is um, as I said, it's being done by a group of women from all over. Um, three of the women now are in Armenia. Um, uh, and uh, one is uh, Dr. Irina Raplanyan, who has been researching Zabel Yesayan um, in the archives, uh, particularly in the, um, the, uh, the, the Soviet um, uh, archives for you know, prisoners, et cetera. The, you know, the KGB archives, I guess, is the right term. She's been trying to find out how exactly she died, um, still working on it. Um, and uh, Shushana Vakyan, who is a, a professor at the American University, who has done the translations of uh, Shushani Kurginyan, and Huri Gatarian, who's also a professor at the university. I mean, all of these amazing women, plus, plus women from um, the United States are working on this. I mean, it's, it's really, and, and two uh, professors uh, from originally from Turkey, uh, Armenian professors. So it's really a group effort, and we're, we're um, basically going through a really, elaborate process with the city government to try to get the posters you know we've 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 created a, you know the design but to get the posters approved and 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 you know for the places to be chosen i mean it's it is a bit of a you know effort and we've actually been working hard to try to get a statue of zabel yasayan too um in yerevan that is even harder so um we're starting first with the posters we've been working on it for well over a year Incredible. I also appreciate that you have this powerful network of diaspora and 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 in Armenia, Armenians who are working toward this. I think that's just a tremendous, what an interesting way to build community around a common cause. And that community extends around the globe. Um, I, this is sort of a broad question, but um, Zabel Yasayan is uh, someone that is a role model whom I think we all should be emulating and learning from. And um, she's tremendous. What can we do? What can our community do 
in order to get the word out and make sure that she is front and center and um, a part of future curricula and, and teaching and learning? Oh, wow. Um, well, you know, we can, uh, you can get her books, um, which is great. I mean, it's, it's wonderful uh, to read her words because she's, she's a wonderful writer and, and um, you know, the translators, of course, it's, it's very important to have, have good translators and, and we're very fortunate to have great translators of these books. Um, in addition, I think, um, well, I'll just give you an example. Um, I mentioned to you that we actually did a Zabel Yassayan human rights essay contest in Artsakh in 2017. We, um, this was organized by the human rights ombudsman in, in Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh, um, because we wanted to introduce her to, to young people, to young high school students. And uh, you know, they were encouraged to write essays. But in addition, we worked uh, with TUMO, which is an educational organization that has a branch in Artsakh. We worked with them to design, to have a t-shirt design contest. So we wanted to connect, you know, words with visuals. And, um, you know, we had a winner and uh, we, we printed up the t-shirts. Unfortunately, we don't have any of those t-shirts left. I know Ali was asking me about it and I, um, you know, if people want t-shirts, we can print up more, but, but we could, I mean, I think, um, you know, reading the gardens of Silidar, I, I have to say there are so many wonderful questions that can be asked. Um, in fact, a very uh, a good friend of mine, Kelsey Rowe, um, who was a Peace Corps volunteer in Armenia, put together an entire curriculum based on the gardens of Silidar and questions about uh, family versus the individual, questions about um, arranged marriages, uh, you know, questions about um, minorities and 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 getting along and in 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 this in the society there were so many great uh, themes that I think that this would be a great book to to use for themes about you know um, all these issues. We really should um, put our heads together and come up with a lesson plan and um, uh, some additional programming around this. I think that there could be some interesting there could be some interest here. Yeah. Um, I think those are the, the questions. I think I covered all of them. If I missed anyone's, please, um, please do reach out to us and I will um, make sure to connect you and your questions um, with Ms. Saryan. Um, thank you so much, uh, Judith Saryan, for being here with us today. Thank you to the community. Thank you all for being here for commemorating the Armenian genocide with us, by learning with us, by learning uh, the legacy and the, and the story of this amazing woman, Zabel Yasayan, and her um, tremendous literary and advocacy efforts. And our efforts continue. Um, I appreciate the, uh, that you mentioned uh, pushing for recognition of the Armenian genocide um, by our current president. I too am very hopeful that this will take place and I am grateful that it has already is long overdue, but it has been recognized by the United States Congress. And I hope that's just the beginning of some meaningful change. Um, for everyone else, thank you again for being here tonight. We look forward to welcoming you, welcoming you back to our center, hopefully next year for an in-person program. And until then, um, be well and take care. <laughs>